I want to tell you a little bit about um, what's happening with the climate and how that affects us as gardeners and how you can ensure that you, your gardening can remain successful, even though we are having a number of very significant um, changes in the climate. Uh, okay, so I want to tell you a little bit about climate change just to get everyone on the same page. First of all, the most important thing to recognize is that essentially all scientists agree that climate change is real and it is here right now. So there is no scientific controversy. You know, that, so you can put that out of your minds. If you're following the science, climate change is here. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about what people in Maryland think about climate change. This is a map. Can you see my cursor? Somebody raise your hand if you can see the cursor. Good, okay. This is a map of Maryland, obviously, and it comes from the Yale Climate Opinion Maps, which is part of this uh, uh, program in climate change communication. And they have surveyed people all over the US uh, since 2009, and they know a lot about what people think about a set of standard questions. And so this map shows what people in Maryland and all the counties think about the, or how they would answer the question, do you accept that climate change is occurring? And overall, 78% of people in Maryland accept that climate change is real. 72% of all Americans. Within Maryland, you can see um, among the different counties that there's quite a bit of variability. Here's a key over here. I'm happy to say that every single county, this is for 2020, every single county, more than 50% of the people accept that climate change is real. Um, some counties are higher, uh, this is, I think, um, oh boy, this is Montgomery County, right? That's Prince George's, that's Montgomery, I think. This is Howard, where I live, 76% of people. Um, so even though a very high fraction of people in Maryland accept that climate change is real, only 63% of people in Maryland think that the scientists agree. And so there's this big mismatch between the scientists who um, have for many, many years accepted that climate change is real and we can measure it, we can see it in our daily lives. Yet, not even two thirds of Marylanders realize that this is true, that scientists agree. And so this leaves open the option for people to sort of say, well, I don't really need to worry about it because after all, the scientists really don't have it together. They don't know whether it's real or not. Okay, <laughs> let's put that to rest. The scientists know. And so it's real important to recognize that. Um, one other really interesting thing from the Yale um, public opinion maps or climate opinion maps, and this is for Howard County, but it's very similar for all the counties in Maryland, is if you look at the way people think about climate risk, um, you can ask people, you know, are you worried about this or that? I'll just go down this list real quick. Are you worried about global warming? So anything over 50% means majority yes. Yes, we're worried about global warming. This is for Howard County, Maryland. Um, will global warming harm plants and animals? 75%, yes. Will it harm future generations? Yes. Will it harm people in developing countries? Yes. Will it harm people in the US? Yes. Is it already harming people in the US? Yes. Now here's the problem. Will global warming harm me personally? Not so much. So even though people think that climate change is affecting everyone else, it's gonna jeopardize plants and animals, there's a discounting of their personal risk. And when people do not feel that there is a risk to themselves personally, they are not as motivated to action. So I think this is kind of an interesting um, blind spot to point out. Um, and most people aren't aware of this, obviously. Um, just to end up on, uh, just to finish up with what the Yale people have found out, in their surveys since 2009, they have um, classified Americans into six groups. They call them the global warming six Americas. And they range from alarmed, people are really worried about it, really wanna do something, wanna change things, to people who are dismissive, just say it's not happening. And these most recent numbers I think are very encouraging because you can see that um, if you add up alarmed, concerned are people who are, are pretty worried, but they're not, you know, like jumping out, they're not going to climate marches or whatever. Cautious are people who are um, probably think something is going on, but they're sort of uh, not really committed to the idea. 
disengaged, too busy to even worry about it, doubtful. Well, I don't really think, I don't know, actually. I don't think something's going on. That's, the, that's what the doubtful people say. Dismissive are hardcore climate denier people. And so these guys aren't really concerned or motivated. These people are very motivated. If you add up all these numbers, uh, 68, uh, 68, 70, 70 um, <laughs> can I add in my head? 72%, is that right? Anyway, something like that. Um, I can, when I'm at the board teaching students, I can never add or do any of that um, under duress. So anyway, a very high fraction, many more than half of people are either cautious, uh, concerned or alarmed. And these numbers have been switching towards that um, end of the spectrum, which is more concerned. And so that's good because until people are worried about it, nobody's willing to do anything. And so I think we're really primed for action now. Um, a little bit of information, sort of hardcore information about what's going on with the temperature. The thing about climate change is just day to day, year to year, you can't detect it because the changes from year to year are very small and there's a lot of variation in the weather. But when you look at all the weather data for every year from 1880 up to 2020, they just put out this map for 20, this graph for 2020. What this um, represents is each year has a bar. And the people at, oh, sorry, this went into the axis, at NASA decided they were going to use the period 1951 to 1980 as a baseline. So at anything that's cooler than it was during that average of that period, that's this. If you average these numbers, it comes out to zero. And before about 1940, it was uniformly cooler. And after about 1980, it was uniformly hotter. But what you can see is that essentially the temperature has been certainly since about 1970, just skyrocketing. Of course, it was rising before that because this, these are negative. So you can really think of it as this whole period is it's going up. This is 2020. 2020, we just learned about two weeks ago, is tied for the hottest year on record with 2016, okay? The last, uh, this is the last six years, last seven years have been the hottest since 1880. So this is a trend a um, really an in, a rapid increase that could not have happened by chance, okay? It's just too systematic. And so this shows you that why scientists um, accept that climate change is happening. Now, why is it happening? Um, you've all heard of the greenhouse effect. And this slide is real quick gonna just review how that works because that's the key to why things are warming up. Um, the, this little cartoon, it just shows the sun shines down on the earth, obviously. Um, and when it hits the earth, it warms it up. We know that. Um, then the heat is lost from the earth by being radiated back into space uh, through the sort of expulsion of heat waves, like an infrared heat lamp. Okay, those are heat waves. And so these are infrared waves, heat waves that bounce back up, they don't bounce, they, they are radiated from the earth and they go out to space. Obviously, if the sun is warming the earth up every day, okay, then something has to happen to get rid of that heat or things warm up. And so in prehistoric times or pre-industrial times, let's put it that way before the industrial revolution, this, about the same amount of heat was generated and was lost. So everything was in balance, right? We stayed at fairly equal temperature. There was weather still, but it wasn't, there was no systematic rising. But um, after the Industrial Revolution, the situation was a little bit different. And that's because um, carbon, di this is the atmosphere, okay? The atmosphere is very thin. It's only uh, maybe around seven miles thick, okay? So when you look up into space, you're looking right through, you look at stars, you're looking right through the atmosphere. We don't care about space, nothing's going on up there. Everything we care about happens in this little seven mile space above the space, above the earth. And um, these oxygen is up there and nitrogen, et cetera. But there are some special gases up there called the greenhouse gases for reasons I'll explain in a minute. And these greenhouse gases interact with these heat waves. And so here's the simple thing. Here's a heat wave going out into space, you know, merrily going through the atmosphere, runs into a molecule of greenhouse gas, gets absorbed, momentarily, just very briefly, and then it gets bounced off in some random direction. So running into that molecule stopped its progress to space. And 
here's an example. Here's a wave that ran into a molecule, came back to Earth. Here's one, ran in, came down here, ran into another one, went out. So the idea is the more of these greenhouse gas molecules you cram into this little space, the more that heat waves bounce around before they can get out. So if you slow them down and don't let them get out, things are gonna warm up, right? So these greenhouse gases are mostly carbon dioxide, also methane and nitrous oxide. Um, but the bottom line here is the more, and humans have increased the release of all of these, okay? This is from burning fossil fuels, gas, oil, coal. This comes from, um, well, yeah, it comes from uh, uh, mostly domesticated animals right now. Nitrous oxide mostly right now comes from application of synthetic fertilizer. So more gas molecules in this space, slower heat loss, more warming. It's like, whoa, that has to happen. It's just physics, right? So there's really no argument. I've never heard a single argument that the greenhouse effect does not work. When people want to not accept climate change, they find some other reason, <laughs> but they can't refute this mechanism. It's the same reason your car gets broiling in the parking lot in the summer. You go away, you, you leave your car, your car's got glass on it. The sun warms it up on the inside, but the glass, like the glass in a greenhouse, keeps that heat from getting out. That's exactly what's happening. Only we don't have glass, we have these wacky gases. Okay, so that's how it works. Um, now, where's all this extra heat going? This is where it gets interesting because it's not staying in the atmosphere, okay? Yeah, the air is warmer, but whoa, it would be a whole lot warmer if the ocean had not absorbed 93% of that heat. So really the big thing is, we should call this ocean warming because <laughs> that's where most of that heat is going. Some of it stays in the atmosphere, some of it stays on land, et cetera. But when we have a warmer ocean, it has a lot of uh, effects. For example, as the ocean warms up, there's more evaporation of seawater. And so more water vapor goes into the air. Then because the air is warmer, it holds more water vapor. You know how there's more, it's more humid in the summer than in the winter? It's because the air holds more water. The warmer air, that rise in temperature I showed you in that graph, holds more water. So there's about seven, this was a little bit old, maybe, maybe almost 10% more water vapor in the air now than there was 100 years ago, okay? That makes a big difference. That means there's more water in the air to come down as rain. So we have more intense rainstorms. Um, and there's a variety of other things that happen, but we, we, uh, we uh, get changes in the winds, changes in the pattern of winds around the earth, changes in the ocean currents. There's a lot of changes that happen here because of this extra heat that gets in the atmosphere. Okay, so the fundamental changes that we see in the climate are warmer air, warmer ocean, more water vapor in the air, and higher sea level. Sea level is higher for two reasons. One is that warm water takes up more space. Now you might think, how could that make a difference? The ocean is huge. There's a lot of water in the ocean. And so up until the last mm, 10 or 15 years, most of the rise in sea level, and if you lived on the Eastern shore, you would, you would be very familiar with this. Most of the rise in sea level is because the water is taking up more space. But now, and this is interesting. So here's the US, here's Canada, um, here's Greenland. The glaciers that are sitting on the land in Greenland are melting like mad, pouring billions of gallons of cold water into the ocean. And we get this, uh, wait, where's my mouse? We get this cold spot. So this is a temperature map. Red is it's hot. This is cold, big glob of cold water at the base of Greenland. And this is about to cause, not about, but this has the potential to cause some mischief with messing around with ocean currents, et cetera higher sea level. All that water is also raising the sea level. So when people say we're worried about this iceberg breaking off of Antarctica and melting, that's because it's gonna add water to the ocean. Um, okay, so this is what scientists call the new normal. This is the way the world is now. We are not going back. <laughs> people would like to think we are going back to the way it was. We are not going back. We are not even staying where we are. It's going to get worse than this, even with our best efforts but we can keep it from getting to a really bad, bad state. 
it's just going to get a little worse than this if we act right away. Okay, gardens. I know you're all thinking, well, when's she going to get to the gardens? Right now. Um, the new normal in the garden. Rising temperatures means, this is an outline of the rest of the talk, warmer winters, earlier springs, more hot days, longer heat waves, fewer cool nights, more variability in the temperature, heavier downpours, more possibility of drought, okay? So these are the things that are already affecting your garden, whether you realize it or not. Again, it's hard to recognize it because it happens very slowly and there's so much year to year variability that you might not realize that, in fact, the winters are warmer. Um, last winter was really warm, and this winter, I think, is also going to be quite warm. It might not feel like it, but we haven't had any, any temperatures in the teens at night really yet, okay? And that seems unusual. I forget what county you're in, I'm really sorry. Um, Hereford, maybe? Baltimore County, okay, thank you. I'm reading your lips, Karen. Baltimore County. Um, so yeah, it's, it's getting warmer up in Baltimore County too. Um, all right, so let's talk about the shorter winters. This is a map that shows how many extra days uh, without frost different parts of the country are now getting. And so this is, um, this is I think current as of about 2014 or 15. In our part of the country, so the the, the feds break up the country into these different regions. We're in the Northeast and we have on average about 10 extra days without frost than we did compared to 1901 to 1960, okay? So even just after 1900, 10 extra days. Longer growing season, that's good. We can grow things, we can you know, plant earlier, harvest later. Shorter, warmer winters. That all sounds really great, but you know, when you warm the winter up, it messes things up a little bit. Um, one thing that has happened um, as a result of the rising global temperature is that the hardiness zones have changed. So here's a picture of what the USDA map of the hardiness zones looked like in 1990. And you're gardeners, so you're all familiar with this. Um, uh, but I didn't know, actually, I knew what, you know, hardiness zone six means certain plants can live here and certain plants can't because of the temperature, but I didn't really know how they calculated it until I looked it up. The hardiness zones are computed as the average lowest temperature reached in the 15 previous years, okay? So that makes sense. But one thing about that is it's, it looks back to the past. It's the average over the previous 15 years. And if it's warming up, then it means that your last frost day predicted according to your hardiness zone, is going to be not right because it's warmer this year than it was in the average of the previous 15 years. So um, what has happened then is as time has passed, that average of the previous 15 years has moved up and that means the hardiness zones have moved. And so um, in about 2004, 2005, the Arbor Day Foundation uh, people kept asking the USDA to come up with a new map because this one, the 1991, was really obsolete. Finally, in 2006, the Arbor Day Foundation said, okay, we're making our own map. Now the USDA has made another map. But um, you're here in Baltimore County. Oh, the seven got moved over a little bit. I put the six over Howard County where I live. Um, but what you can see is if you compare this green boundary, that's zone six, the yellow is zone seven. Um, and look right there. We live in an interesting place because we were right on the boundary between zone six and zone seven, right? So you're right about there under the six. Now, if you look at this part of Maryland, we're all in zone seven. And every year, it, these zones are creeping upwards, 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 a little bit higher. So, you know, pretty soon, look down here at, um, at uh, North Carolina, how much now is orange in zone eight? and how little used to be orange back in the 1990s. So we'll all be, actually I've already grown peanuts, but we'll all be grown peanuts up here <laughs> pretty soon. Um, if any of you have not grown peanuts, they're really fun to grow because they're bizarro. They, they put their flowers out above ground. And I, you know, I, the whole summer I'm thinking, okay, here's the flowers. How do we get the peanuts? They send these wacky little structures down into the ground and make the peanuts underground <laughs> from these flowers that are up in the air. It's really worth doing if you haven't if you haven't planted peanuts before. Okay, warmer winters. Uh, one of the biggest impacts of warmer winters on gardeners is more weeds. Okay, now I don't know about you, 
but my yard is filled with chickweed right down here, chickweed. I have a lot of this stuff. This is a, a bitter cress, I think. And then there's these things, I forget the actual name of it, but these fake strawberry things all over the place, impossible to get rid of. So this is what my yard looks like basically. Um, one of the reasons, well, of course, one of the reasons that things become weeds is they grow very well in um, disturbed areas and they do okay when conditions change. And it turns out that though, uh, when it comes to the warmer winters, the weeds are benefiting more than the native plants or than your crop plants. So the weeds are overwintering like crazy. I mean, you know, this chickweed, and I, I, this, I didn't take this picture, but the chickweed in my yard, it's just doing great. You know, it's all over the place. The only benefit of chickweed is it has these little shallow roots so you can rip it up, but still. Um, the weeds are living better over the winter and they're flowering earlier. Well, they're flowering half the time, they're flowering all winter, but they flower earlier. And so um, they produce a ton of seeds, okay? It's really hard to get rid of them. So the weeds have a competitive edge over native plants. The native plants don't come up all that much earlier. And so by the time the native plants come up, the weeds have already taken up a lot of space. Um, so one way to keep the weeds down in the winter is to mulch in the fall or plant cover crops in your garden. Um, mulch, I'll talk later about mulching with weeds, with, uh, excuse me, with uh, leaves. And that's a really great thing to do. If you cover the space, then the chickweed can't grow. Um, and that'll cut down your overwintering weeds. Um, adapting to increased weed pressure. Well, this is like our life right now is the weeds are just out there in force. Again, mulching is very important. Stop tilling. I'll talk more about that later. But every time you turn over the soil with a shovel or with a tiller, you bring weed seeds up to the surface. And those weed seeds can live in the soil. This will kill you for like 100 years. <laughs> so if you let a bunch of weeds in your garden go to seed, those seeds are going to be there for the rest of your life. Every time you dig, they will come to the surface and they will germinate. Um, and so you want to mulch. Uh, this shows a couple kinds of mulch here. Uh, we've got some tomatoes or something it looks like. And um, a lot of people mulch with newspaper uh, and, and that works okay, but sort of annoying because the pieces are little and they blow around. Um, this is, uh, looks like somebody put down a bunch of paper bags. I used to unfold the paper you, we would get in Amazon packages and, and lay that out. You can mulch with straw. If you just use straw by itself, you have to use a lot of straw, like seven or eight inches, or otherwise the weeds come up through and then it's really hard to get rid of them. I used to mulch with paper and then put straw on the top so it looked really well, really good. But I made a huge discovery this year, and that's this. This is the horticultural paper. This stuff comes in rolls that are 100 feet long and four feet wide. And so you just roll it out over your row, if you have a four foot wide row or cut it to what you want, roll it out, put, you know, put something on the edges. And then these are my basil plants last year. You, I just cut a little hole there where I wanted to put my transplant in and planted the transplants in there. And you can see how big these plants are and there are no weeds because they're all into the paper. The only weeds come right up in there. And this paper lasted the entire season. So, <laughs> I should be on the payroll of this paper company, I'm telling you, because I love this stuff. Uh, and it's worth every penny. I can't remember how much 100 feet costs, but um, whatever it is, it's worth it. Um, the other thing that's really great, a great advantage as far as I'm concerned is sort of new weeding tools. Not new, but not the standard like hoe, you know, that you have to pick up and so, I get, they make me so tired. Pick that thing up and wop, 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 really tired. So I like these three things. The stirrup hoe, this, there's a little, this is a, a blade. It's not, it's a little bit sharp. It wouldn't cut you. It's not like a knife. It's a little sharp though, and you can sharpen it with a file. Um, and it has a hinge here and you, put, you leave it on the ground. You don't pick it up. You push it back and forth. And as you push it, it goes about, let me see. It goes about oh, I don't know, a quarter of an inch under the surface and cuts those weeds right off. So if you use that here, you go push, 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 those weeds are all cut off. <laughs> That's great. And then you just pick up the little carcasses and get rid of them. Um, the hand hoe, so this, this you're standing up. The hand hoe and the garden bandit um, are both, you're on your knees, but 
still so much easier. You can really whip through the, um, the weeds that way. If you're going to get close to your transplants or your beans or whatever you have, I get a little too enthusiastic with the stirrup hose. So I've been known to like <laughs> cut a whole row of my beans off because I'm like wailing around in there with the stirrup hose. So it's better. I have to try to make myself do the hand hoe or the garden bandit. But now that I found the paper, and I'll show you a few more pictures of this in, in slides coming up. I Last summer, I hardly had a weed at all. So it was really great. Weed early, weed often, and get them when they're small. That's the key. So you don't want to let them grow up any bigger than this. You want to get rid of those things and put the mulch down um, so your bean plants can use all the sun and all the nutrition in the soil. Now, warmer winters. Insects love warmer winters, okay? They're also overwintering better. They're coming out earlier. There are more generations per year. Many insects, you know, insects live their life at the speed of the temperature around them. And so when it's warmer, they live their life faster. And sometimes they can have a whole nother generation in one year. They can add another generation. And that means there's just more and more and more insects. And many insects are expanding their range. So um, this is especially true in some forest pests like hemlock woolly adulgid is killing all the hemlocks on the East Coast and they're moving north, north, north. And eventually they'll move all the way up north and kill all the hemlocks. Um, it's very hard to get rid of pests of forest trees. So what are we gonna do about pests in our gardens? Um, as I said, they come out earlier, they reproduce more quickly. You can get really a boatload of these of insects in your yard uh, overnight, practically. Probably the most important thing you can do is to be vigilant, get out there and look every day. So here's this guy, he's out there investigating these, um, some kind of cucurbit plant squash or cucumber and looking at them, looking at the leaves, does he see the eggs of squash bugs? Does he see any damage on the um, base of the vine that indicates he might have a squash borer. If he finds that, then he can take you know, remedial action. But if you're just like happily looking at your plants and you don't look for the pests, then by the time you see them, your plants are toast. Um, I never used to like row covers. This is row cover. It's a uh, non-woven, very thin material that you can spread, you know, spread out over your bed and wait down on the edge, and then insects can't get in there, okay? And this is a sort of even an improvement of that. This is just insect netting that this person has put over a raised bed supported with wire hoops, and the insects can't get in there. Now that's awesome for plants that don't need to be pollinated. For stuff like this that needs to be pollinated, I put that row cover on there and take it off only when it's time for those flowers to be pollinated. Okay, and that really helps a lot. I had to go through some very bad summers before I acknowledged that I couldn't just happily look at my plants. I like to look at my plants in the garden. I don't like to cover them up, but <laughs> it was a choice between looking at them and having anything to harvest. And so I decided, okay, I'd rather have something to harvest. Um, you need to know what you're gonna do before the pests show up. You know, are you gonna go out there and knock those squash bugs into a little, they have soapy water where they drown, or you're gonna spray or what? So it's important to know what you're gonna do. And if you have not communicated with the experts at University of Maryland Extension who run the Home and Garden Information Center, um, they know everything, okay? So if you send them a picture, they will identify what you have. And then they will say, go to this page and you will learn what to do. <laughs> so um, it is a tremendous amount of information and it's your tax dollars paying for it. So you may as well take advantage of it. Um, now, here's another thing you can do. Um, if you don't like to spray, and I don't, mostly because, uh, well, to really spray, you have to go to classes and get certified. And you know what? I don't like to have a lot of chemicals around. So one thing you can do is to make use of the natural enemies. For every pest insect, there are more than one thing out there that wants to eat them. And so everybody's familiar with ladybugs and how ladybugs eat aphids and whatnot. This is ladybug larva. Um, it looks really different than ladybug, right? Um, this is, that's an aphid, okay? You guys know that. But this thing, this maggot licking thing, okay? This is a fly. This is a fly larva. 
it is the juvenile form of that. This is a hoverfly, which is, it, it's mimicking a bee so that its predators will stay away from it. But it's actually a fly, it only has two wings. And its larvae look like this. These larvae cruise around on leaves and chow down on aphids like crazy. I mean, they eat maybe 50 in a day. Um, this is a lacewing, it's a predator, also eats things. This is the, these are the eggs of the lacewing. Oh, sorry. Oh man, okay, go back, go back. Um, these are the eggs of the lacewing. This is a minute pirate bug, really small, but very common. If you look at your plants, you'll see them. And it has a beak and it has stabbed this aphid and it is going to suck it out, okay? Um, this is a ground beetle. You usually don't see ground beetles because they only come out at night, but they prowl around your garden and eat a ton of stuff. So you really want to make it nice for them. Same with spiders. You might not like spiders. You might not want them walking on your hand, but they eat a lot of insect pests. So you want to make your garden a happy place for spiders. How do you do that? You plant native plants. As, 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 most of these aren't native. I put this picture in for those guys are native. Some of them are native. Native plants provide nectar, pollen, and a place for these um, natural enemies to live. And um, it's also important to mulch the beds, like to have, if you have like a straw or even the paper, the spiders live under the paper, um, the ground beetles live under the paper where it's cool and wet. In the winter, if you have some mulch out there, they overwinter under the mulch and they stay really happy. And then they're ready to come out and eat your pest next spring. Um, so uh, there's a lot of information about these guys on the home and garden um, uh, information site. Um, then there are the parasitoid wasps. Okay, so we all know a parasite is like a tapeworm. Okay, a parasite lives in its host and sort of takes nutrition from it, but doesn't kill it. A parasitoid, that's what this is. They're usually wasps or flies. A parasitoid lays an egg. Here's a parasitoid fly laying an egg in one tiny little corn earworm egg. Okay, and this guy's really small. Here's a parasitoid wasp laying egg, an egg. So this is its thorax and it curls its abdomen around and sticks its little ovipositor, which looks like a stinger into the aphid and inserts an egg in there. And then that larva is sort of gruesome, but it's kind of cool too. Um, I used to work on P aphids, so I really love these guys, but uh, that wasp egg hatches. And then the wasp larva, which is sort of like a maggot, cruises around in there and eats the inside of the aphid up, eats, 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 until it, the wasp, is ready to form a pupa. Then it messes with the brain of the aphid, okay? Somehow, I don't know how this happens, and the aphid crawls up to the top of the plant, and then the, it turns into what is called an aphid mummy. I don't know all the chemistry involved here, but the wasp makes it turn into this hardened form, and then the wasp turns into the wasp pupa, turns into a adult wasp like that, and it cuts away a little hole and flies out. No more aphid. <laughs> the aphid is all gone. It's all been consumed. So that's what a parasitoid does. Many of you have seen these on a tomato hornworm. So a tomato hornworm is great big. And so the wasp can lay a lot of eggs in there. And when the tomato hornworm wasp larvae are ready to pupate, they come through the cuticle, they like blast out of the cuticle and form a pupil case on the outside where you can see it. Not like this in the inside, on the outside. And so I'm sure some of you have seen these white things on these caterpillars, okay? And you should be really happy when you see that because even though this caterpillar kept eating, okay, um, this is the front of the caterpillar, by the way, these are the legs. This is a fake, there's some fake eyes in the back here. Um, but this caterpillar has served as a food source for a ton of little wasps and it doesn't take these guys too long to grow up. So if you let, leave these out in your yard, in your, on your tomato plants, you will eventually not have as many tomato hornworms. Okay. So that's, that's that. These guys, the natural enemies are really our saviors. If we protect them, give them something to eat, some place to live, you don't have to spray because they're out there killing this, all the pests for you every day. And then when the day living, the day active ones go to bed, then the spiders and the 
um, ground beetles come out and do it. Okay, that's it for natural enemies. Hotter summers. Um, uh, it's getting hotter in the summer, obviously, if the average temperature is rising. And heat stress is really hard on plants, not just because it dries the soil, but for many plants, in particular, tomatoes and sweet corn, it, heat messes up the uh, pollination, okay? The pollen is still okay, but it doesn't pollinate the fruit. And so you get tomatoes that don't have any seeds, very many seeds. And if you don't have very many seeds in these cavities, then there's, you don't have very much of that good juicy stuff that makes a tomato worth having. And so that's not too great. Also, the other effect, there's two other effects of heat on tomatoes. One is you get this fibrous stuff in the wall of the tomato and it makes it really hard to peel and it doesn't taste very good. And if you have processing tomatoes, it like wrecks half the meat of a processing tomato. So heat is hard. You can help yourself, I think I'm gonna show you later, but by putting shade over your tomatoes. If you have really hot weather, when your corn is pollinating, you get um, areas, you get like an area like this at the end that's not pollinated, okay? And sometimes kernels that were pollinated, when it's really hot, the plant stops photosynthesizing and, and it can't fill these kernels with you know, starch and sugar. And so the kernels abort and you get these, you know, I'm sorry, kernels down here that there might be an empty space down here where there's no kernel. And some of these guys are on the process of dying. The other thing that happens is that tomatoes, it's very hard to see. This is a tomato. Here's a tomato flower. Here's where there was a tomato flower, but it fell off because it was too hot. Too hot. Plant says, I can't do this. I can't grow a fruit. Forget it. I'm dropping this off. Peppers drop their flowers and their fruits when it's too hot in the day or too hot at night, okay? And the night temperatures are really warming up. So here's a picture of my garden last summer. I wanted to plant some beans in the paper. So this, this, this is to show you two things. I thought, how am I gonna plant beans in the paper because I'm not putting in transplants? And I thought, I'll just cut these little slots in the paper and plant the beans in the slots, okay? Where's my cursor? Right there. So bing, 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 bing. I planted the beans down in the slots. And that worked like crazy. I couldn't believe it. It, it. These are the beans that I planted earlier. Okay, so they grew great. And they came up in the slots and there were a few weeds, but in between, no weeds. So it was, uh, it was really, really great. And this particular day was super hot. And so I thought, I can't hack it when it gets too hot out there in the middle of the day. I just get really sick. And so I took my beach umbrella out there and jammed it in the soil by where I wanted to plant. And that really helped. I mean, it looks sort of stupid, right? I'm out there under my beach umbrella in the middle of my garden, but who cares, right? I stayed really cool. I was really happy. I got my beans planted. So take care of yourself. This is important. Hotter summers, your garden is hot during the day. You got to drink water. You got to be really careful or otherwise you'll get sick. Okay, adapting to increased temperature. Plant earlier in the spring, yay, and later in the fall. Um, you can't believe the last, the last and first frost dates anymore for the reason I explained. They're based on the past. And if you're willing to be a little risky, you can put plants out, summer plant transplants out before you know, it says you should from the last frost date, as long as you're ready to go out there with a sheet or some kind of covering, just in case we get a late frost, but you can get stuff started really early. If you do that, then you get a harvest before it gets brutally hot in the middle of the summer. Um, if you mulch the soil, it keeps, you put mulch around um, with that paper or the plant material or use plastic mulch, whatever, uh, it keeps the soil cooler and it keeps the water in. You can also try heat tolerant varieties and there are heat tolerant varieties of like broccoli and lettuce and other things. Uh, this is a picture from uh, Johnny's seed catalog. Um, you can shade, they recommend getting shade cloth and putting it over hoops like this to shade your lettuce. Um, here's an experiment that a guy in Georgia did. He shaded some peppers and you can't see here, but he used the silver plastic reflective mulch and that keeps the soil really cool. And it has an extra benefit that the sun shines down, okay? 
and the plants get some of that sun. Then that sun hits the reflective mulch and bounces back and the plants get another shot at the, at the light. But I have to warn you, if you get this stuff, you've got to wear your sunglasses outside because it is so bright, it'll just burn out your retinas. Not really, but you'll feel un uncomfortable. So um, I've tried this. I really like it. I used it under my peppers last year. I don't, I, I don't like to use plastic, but I rationalize that if I use it like for three years, it's not, it's only one third as bad. Nothing's perfect, right? The paper, I'm, I'm sort of sold on the paper though. So I'm going to switch over to that. All right. Now drought. Drought is, this is California. This isn't Maryland. Um, but drought is much more likely everywhere with climate change. It's not nearly as likely in Maryland as it is in California. This is what, I mean, they've had 10 years of drought. They had, they had four years of intensive drought and that's what, this is what their almond orchard looks like. This is what many of their fields look like. And they're really hurting for water out there right now. Um, California is a scary place to be as far as I'm concerned, because it's too dry and there's not enough water and there's, now there's fires, et cetera. Maryland is not gonna escape droughts. Um, if you are wondering about what the water situation in your garden is going to be, you can go to the US drought monitor. You can just Google drought monitor and it'll show you every day a map of the whole country and it'll tell you what the drought conditions are. Now we do have droughts in Maryland sometimes. Um, and even if we're not having a drought, it's important to water wisely, don't waste water. Um, because fresh water is a very limited resource. Um, and there are different ways to use water wisely. Um, you can set up a drip irrigation thing, which I keep saying I'm going to do, but I never do. There's a big startup time on that. You have to you know, get it all arranged and whatnot. So um, this again is my yard. Uh, I'm, I, I should confess, I'm not a master gardener. I'm not a horticulturist, but I try a lot of stuff and some of it works. So um, I'm not showing you any of the things that didn't work. Um, this is my row. Here's those beans where I put those things in, but I put two soaker hoses down under the paper. And then down at the end, I had them joined uh, with the Y and I can just screw on a hose and turn it on and go away for two hours. And then the whole thing gets watered. And the water is, um, you just drizzled out there from the soaker hose and um, it wets the paper, but it's not spraying out in the air. So this over here is what you do not want to do. I was shocked to find on the Michigan State Extension website. I don't know if you can see this, it's a little bit hard to see. This is one of those sprinklers that oscillates. So in the middle of the day out there, they've got this sprinkler oscillating like this, putting the water up in the air like something like 70% of that water evaporates before it ever gets to the plants. Incredibly inefficient. So you don't wanna use a sprinkler in your, in your garden. You also, this is one of my big pet peeves right now. You also do not wanna use one of these like Home Depot um, uh, sprayer things for the, for the end of your hose because it has a little teeny opening, maybe like a quarter of an inch. So hardly any water gets through there. And even though it puts out a spray, I'm pointing with my finger, it puts out a spray and you think you're putting a lot of water on, you're actually hardly putting any water on. So this is what I do. Um, I finally worked this out, it took me a while, but I have a three quarter inch hose, most ho hoses five eighths inch. Now that doesn't matter, you don't have to get a bigger hose, but, I put on this thing on the end called a water breaker. And this is a little valve thing at the end. It's called a full flow valve. So if your hose is, is five eighths inch, so it's you know, got a little hole in there like this, all that water goes through this, okay? It's not a little, many of these hose end things that you can turn off have a little tiny quarter inch opening and hardly any water comes out. All the water comes through and then it goes into this thing, which has, I think, I don't know, 500 holes on the, uh, it has an aluminum plate with 500 holes and the water comes barreling out of there, but it's gentle. And so you can water, you know, this is, this is an experiment I was working on, but um, you can water and it doesn't knock over your plants. Very gentle, but a lot of water comes out. So if you're like me and you don't wanna stand there for the rest of your life watering, then this is an awesome solution to that. This is even better because you can go in and do something while it's watering. But if you're gonna stand up and water, you might as well 
get some water on there. That's my philosophy. Water deeply every few days, not shallowly. If you water deeply, then the plants send their roots down and they use the water more effectively. Um, okay, now, okay, it's dry. It's getting drier in the summer because there is no additional rainfall, but the rain that is falling spring, summer, and fall is coming down fast as downpours. And I think, uh, I don't have these anymore, but I used to get these flash flood warnings on my phone. And it seemed like I was getting a flash flood warning like all the time because the water would come down so fast. And, um, and this is some data that show that compared to, um, uh, uh, let me make sure I can explain this. If you take all of the rainfalls that came down between 1958 and 2012, and you took just the top 1% of the heaviest ones, then we are seeing almost twice as much, twice as many of those heavy, heavy rainfalls as we did back um, during that earlier period 50 years ago. So, um, you know, your garden can get flooded out and look like this. Now, that's a problem if you have a lot of wetness in your garden like that because plant pathogens spread, it, it can wash out seedlings, it can stunt your plants or whatever, it can cause soil compaction. Most home gardeners don't put their gardens in a place that's going to get like that, okay? And if you have your garden in a place that floods, you probably want to put some drainage ditches around it or something. Um, but you have to be very careful if you have like carrots or something, even lettuce that you can't wash very well. It's okay if the water just comes down and puddles in your garden, but if it's super, super heavy and it comes from your neighbor's yard or some other place, or you have a farm next to you, or you have some other industrial parking lot or something next to you, and the water comes over onto your property and pools, then you don't want to eat those fresh vegetables that have been touched by that flood water because you don't know what's in it, okay? Could have come from your neighbor's place. Maybe there's dog poop in it. That's nothing against your neighbor, okay? Everybody has a dog, has some dog poop in their yard. And, um, or if a parking lot, all kinds of stuff can come over there. So you have to be really careful if you get flooded produce. Okay, now, so there are some things you can do to be more successful. And I'm running out of time now, but I wanna tell you a few things you can do to have a more climate friendly garden, which means to be sort of part of the climate solution by not contributing so much to uh, carbon dioxide emissions. The first thing you can do is, I don't know how many of you like to start your own transplants from seed, um, but uh, when you buy transplants like this from the garden, they come in these little plastic pots, okay? Plastic pots, you know, most people, you can recycle them if you're careful, but most people throw them away. And of course, plastic is made out of petroleum products, so it carbon emissions. Most of them have been sprayed, okay? Most of them are planted in a peat-based potting mix and peat is dug up in the, you know, up in the um, northern parts of Canada. Um, and that's not a very climate friendly thing. So you can grow your own transplants pretty easily. You need a couple of shop lights. You can get an LED shop light like this four feet long for like 40 bucks, okay? It's not very expensive. Um, even less, I think at Costco sometimes. Um, and so this is a picture um, of um, inside my house where I have a four foot wide rack and I've got a, three sets of lights on the shelf. They're hanging from, from chains and you can adjust them up and down. Um, and I'm just showing you, you know, you can grow the transplants in little pots like this. You can grow them in a, what's called a plug flat. This has uh, 72 little places. Sorry, I keep clicking my mouse. I can't do that. 72 little places where you can grow things. It's really easy to grow stuff from seed. So um, um, I've got broccoli, lettuce, and all kinds of stuff growing in my living room right now. Um, so you can start with um, a, a sustainable potting mix and you can use reusable pots or those plug flats. You can just wash them, use them over and over again. No waste. Um, I have not yet closed in on a really perfect mix that does not have peat in it, but I have tried coconut core, which is ground up coconut shells. And when you rehydrate it, it looks like this. Um, this is um, rice hulls. It's a really nice thing to substitute for vermiculite or perlite. This is a potting mix called 
pit moss, which is made out of recycled paper. It's pretty cool, but you can't use it by itself. So I'm trying to get good combinations of these that drain as well and hold water as well as the commercial mixes. I haven't quite closed in on it yet, but um, I usually use 50% seed starting mix and 50%, you know, some mixture of this stuff. So again, like the plastic, it's only half as bad as if I used all peat based mix, but uh, so you have to experiment. If you're not an experimenter, then probably just buy, you know, buy your seed mix. Okay, for a really climate friendly garden and a garden that is going to do very well in heat and too much rain, you want to build your soil health. And um, the first step to that is don't till. And I'll discuss it more, I think, in the next slide. It's really useful to have compost and if you make it yourself, then you reduce food waste. Um, and so you can compost leaves and yard stuff in open bins like this, but if you compost food, you have to have a closed bin so you don't get a bunch of rodents. Um, the uh, composted material is really rich in um, organic matter and all the microbes in the soil and the earthworms and things that aren't microbes, they all need that stuff. They use it for food, right? And then they build soil health. So when you put a lot of organic material in your, or compost in your um, garden, your soil will hold more water, but it will still drain well, okay? Um, so you can add compost you make yourself out of food scraps. Compost your leaves, really great. You can plant cover crops. Here's a raised bed where somebody's planted at the end of the season clover, okay, and then you just weed whack it into oblivion in the spring and plant right into it. Um, the cover crops add organic material, they add roots, they keep the microbes happy because the microbes feed on the roots. Um, they, if you plant something like um, uh, winter peas or, um, or clover, that they're nitrogen fixers, they add nitrogen. And also, instead of just leaving your garden beds bare, which will cause a lot of erosion or allow a lot of erosion. You wanna keep the soil covered. So pretend this is the fall and there's no plants here. Um, and this is just covered with mulched up, lawnmower, chopped up leaves. You jam them on the top of you, just dump them on the top of your bed, spread them out, let them sit there all winter. And then in the spring, you can just ooch them apart, put in your transplant, put them back, you're all done. Now that is my idea of gardening, right? Really easy. Okay, use your hand tools, okay? Don't get out there with a bunch of power tools. Um, we can talk later, if you ever wanna talk about landscaping, we can talk about how to reduce your lawn, um, how to weed smart, you wanna mulch, you wanna put your cover crops in. You wanna put as little synthetic nitrogen fertilizer on as you can because synthetic nitrogen fertilizer is um, very energy intensive to make. They have to use natural gas to make it. And um, if you uh, plant legumes in your soil, these are peas that I planted in my yard this last year. And the, you can see these nodules on there, okay? So inside those little lumpy things on the roots are zillions of nitrogen fixing bacteria. Now, what does that mean? It means the bacteria in there take nitrogen out of the air there's nitrogen in the air is two nitrogen atoms stuck together. Nothing on the planet can use nitrogen in that form, but these bacteria turn it into um, ammonia, basically fertilizer, and then they dump it into your ground. And so if you plant legumes, it really boosts your soil up. Uh, here's a close up of the garden bandit in action, getting a little weed at the base of an onion. You can do this precision weeding with these garden bandits. Okay. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'll just say a few more things here. Tilling, climate, very, very climate unfriendly. The tiller uses fuel, it puts out carbon emissions. Um, I can't, I mean, if I had to do this, I would just be in the world's grouchiest mood ever because it's really hard. And all of this disturbing the soil turns out to be the worst thing you can do because what happens is, a lot of the organic material, the soil has a lot of structure, okay? And the organic material is held in this structure. When you blast through there with your tiller, it breaks the structure up. 
it exposes all that organic material to microbes, which eat it. <laughs> and then, so you add, you spend all this time putting compost in your yard, you till it and the microbes eat it. So it's like totally self-defeating. Also, the soil does not absorb very much water when you till it because it often gets eroded and then it gets a crust on it. People think that tilling like loosens it up. No, actually tilling leads to soil compaction. So if you don't till, you leaves the soil structure intact and improves the infiltration of water. It keeps that decomposable carbon and organic material underground, keeps those weed seeds underground and it saves fuel time and your back, right? So you can be inside drinking coffee instead of doing this. So just roll out that paper, boom, takes five minutes. Roll it out, you're all set. And there's my little Y thing where I hook the hose on. Okay, no-till gardening. Some people like this old world garden farms, they're really into it. They have permanent beds where they only grow stuff and then permanent paths where they walk. And in the winter, they plant ryegrass on the beds. And then they, in the spring, they, uh, I think take their weed whacker and get really just weed whack it right down. And then they plant right in there. Um, and they also, they, oh, every year also they dump compost on the top. So they're really into no-till gardening. This is what no-till gardens look like, often have compost piled up, you know, in a raised bed like that. Um, and there's different, a lot of different instructions out there on the web for how you can do no-till gardening. I don't do full no-till gardening um, because I never seem to have time to organize it, but I try not to till, um, not to disturb the soil any more than I absolutely have to, because every time you do, you get weeds. Okay. Ah, oh, well, that is my last slide. So I just want to end on a note, um, which is, uh, you know, a lot of stuff is happening out there that we don't have control over. And um, the point is we do have control over our little sphere. We can control our part of the world, our yard, our house. We can control what we do. And so I like to show people this little mind map or cartoon that I got from a, a place, a site in Australia. And I love it because it basically is like, you can do something. Here's all the things you can do. You know, if you cut down on air travel, that's very friendly. Um, you can get a fuel efficient car. You can walk or bike, you can use public transit. You can combine errands. You can do a lot of energy stuff in your house. It's really not that hard to save a ton of energy and we have the power. So I just like to, Feel, I like to have, I like to help people feel that we can do something. This is not, climate change is not a thing which is just happening to us. We can actually do something to slow it down. And I think that's kind of important. Um, so I'll just end there. And um, I, I would love to tell you this is my yard, but this is totally not my yard. <laughs> I just wish it was my yard.